Testing, one, two, three. Testing. Testing. <clears throat> Good morning. Ugh. All right.
Wolverine Soft, I believe, is uh, available and open to a bunch of, uh, of different people. You don't have to be a student, I don't think. However, um, I think there are some caveats when it comes to the studio and whether or not you can be an officer. Um, I would wait for Amber Renton's response. She'll probably respond here in the chat uh, if she's up. Uh, otherwise, uh, uh, I would, you can send her an email or join the Wolverine Soft Discord server and ask there. Will do each. Dong Zuhu, uh, the answer is sort of. It changes how the game is experienced. So if you if you program and implement your game uh, and take time to essentially mean frames, um, then the gameplay experience, as long as you're processing the frames at uh, 60 frames per second, like on every single piece of hardware you're running your game on, the game, it'll be fine. The experience will be kind of, um, it'll be consistent, and it'll all be good. However, for games that are running on different pieces of hardware, for instance, if you put a game out through Steam, and you have a bunch of different players playing on different spec machines, so some potato machines, some kind of medium spec machines, economy machines, and then on some super hyper fast paced, uh, 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 powerful, um, you know, i9 machines, uh, uh, GTX 1030, uh, sorry, GTX uh, 3, 320 Ti, 
uh, machines, um, then they're gonna have different experiences. Uh, you might have the game run super fast, right? So it might be doing above 60 FPS, which means everything in the game, the logic of the game will proceed very quickly. Uh, so quickly, in fact, that your, your players might not be able to keep up with it. If you play on a potato spec, you might only be able to achieve like 15 frames per second, which means every piece of logic in your game that deals with time will execute three, uh, sorry, four times slower than a normal 60 FPS experience. Um, so a lot of teams will say, you know what, let's not, let's not, let's not advance time in terms of frames. Let's advance time in terms of seconds, right? Time, right? Um, and so what will happen is your game logic will say, how much time has passed in this frame? And we're going to multiply, or we're going to we're going to make our work, make our movement, make our whatever, our logic, a function of how much time has passed since the previous frame. And in this way, you you can have a game that's running at 30 FPS or even 15, and the logic still executes kind of in a vaguely similar way to how it would if it was running at 60 FPS, um, because it can kind of interpolate a bit. Um, but in, I'll be honest, in my experience, I think it, I'm not a huge fan of it, right? Uh, most developers really like the, um, the kind of time-based approach uh, where, hey, if a player is playing on a potato, then okay, it's going to be choppier, but the game logic will still be consistent. Um, this isn't always true, and you sometimes have to do certain things to make sure that, for instance, you won't warp an object through a wall because... You know, a lot of time passed since the previous frame. We need to make this object move quite far because only, you know, a lot of time had passed. And whoop, we just sent it right through a wall, okay? Um, also, I, I found that um, uh, at least it's a little bit easier to program simulations that you can fast forward or slow down uh, if you go with kind of a more, more frame-based approach. Um, but a lot of developers really don't like frame-based timing approaches. Uh, and I can understand why. Um, uh, but anyway, uh, okay, very good question, and there are a lot of resources online that you can find for this topic if you if you want a deeper explanation of the trade-offs. Okay, all right, everyone. Uh, thank you for, uh, cool, thank you for uh, joining us. It looks like we've got 19 people here. Just a few minutes ago, I think it was only five, so I was prepared for a day full of memes. Uh, if no one shows up to our lecture, uh, we get that. Um, however, we're only going to have a few memes today since most of you have, in fact, shown up. Okay, so uh, let's get going. Today I want to talk about a couple things. I want to talk about one of your big, interesting new assignments, which is the marketing assignment, which releases today. Uh, you should be able to find that on Canvas now. Um, and then I want to talk about a really interesting topic, games and AI. Okay, if you are interested in going to grad school for computer science, there's a very good chance uh, that you'll be dealing with AI, machine learning, and that kind of stuff. How that applies to games and how game teams are trying to use that these days, uh, we'll be seeing pretty soon. Um, in the meantime, though, I do have a few interesting, fun announcements to uh, make. Um, so I just saw this video clip of the world's most famous fighting game player, Daigo Umehara, uh, versus one of the world's most famous uh, video game characters, uh, Sans Undertale. <laughs> Sometimes people give him that last name. Not sure why, but it's funny. Let's take a look. And I want you to notice the emotion. Keep track of the emotion during this gameplay footage that you notice. Okay? Come on, Twitch. Come on. Hey. What are we doing? Microphone warning. You're kidding me, Johnny. I, I, uh, so I, I love this clip. Oh, my brows is lagging big time. Um, I love that clip, uh, not just because of, of uh, Daigo uh, getting his butt handed to him by Sans, um, but <laughs> because of the raw emotion that you see there. Right, uh, it, it really is incredible, and it's something that isn't entirely unique to games, but something that is very much a part of games, 
when players play, you often get just incredible emotion, right? People are enthusiastic about the challenges that they engage in in this medium. Uh, they're enthusiastic about the characters they meet. They're enthusiastic about the adventures that they go on. Uh, from trade shows where new trailers get shown off and people are crying in the audience uh, to people who are trying to defeat some of the most famous challenges in gaming, crying out in agony at the last second, right? Uh, the agony of defeat, the uh, thrill of victory. Um, there, you know, think of other things that inspire this kind of energy and passion. Uh, you think about uh, sports, right? People on the field, people in the stands, just going crazy, right? At Michigan Stadium. We'll be back there soon enough, right? Um, and hopefully the football team will too. Um, and, uh, you know, movies, the best movies, bringing you to tears as, as characters separate, never to see each other again, or someone is lost, or um, it, is, it, is, it is good company that this medium finds itself in. And what's particularly amazing about that clip is you have one of the most famous uh, players in the world uh, going crazy, exhibiting such emotion over an indie game that was created by one musician in about two years. Right? So you too can inspire that level of energy and passion. You can do it. Okay? And some of your projects are starting to get to that point. I think some of you may be noticing this in your, uh, your feedback, uh, your, your playtesting footage. So anyway, uh, uh, keep this in mind. Okay? Uh, you have more power than you might think uh, as, you, as you make these experiences. Okay. I want to show you, I, I saw uh, the other day this really uh, funny GIF that shows off a bunch of classic games where the balancing has been changed. The mechanics are still there, but a lot of the core decisions of these games are made trivial by certain changes. You'll see what I mean, okay? Let's take a look. We've got Tetris. Tetris, except every single block is the long one. <laughs> We've got Duck Hunt, except you've got the Doom Gun, so you just kind of spam it and you win. We got Pac-Man, but the you know the maze is not so much a maze anymore, and the ghosts are boxed in. You've got Cubert, but there are only two spaces, so no matter what you do, you're going to win in two turns. You've got Legend of Zelda, where you walk in, it's dangerous to go alone. Take this, you get the Triforce, you win. You've got Mario Kart, where you get this this like armored carrier, and you win. You've got Punch Out, where your opponent is held and cannot make any moves against you. Um, you've got Wii Fit, where you can choose to. <laughs> to just eat a burrito if you want. Um, you've got Pong, where you've got this big paddle and you win. You've got Mortal Kombat. Okay, so some of this humor is a little bit a little bit morbid and maybe not not an incredible taste. Uh, but the important thing here is it's, it's making a point about how you really need to be careful with your balancing. You need to be careful about how you construct your levels in your context in your game, not just your game mechanics. Because you really don't want your decisions to become trivial. Um, this can happen sometimes in games where you make a change to your level, you make a change to how another mechanic works, and another mechanic that used to be important is now trivial. Like you should always use it or you should never use it. It's just in that balancing, right? The, the mere act of tweaking numbers and some designs, uh, some stage designs, uh, can take entire parts of your game and just eliminate them right, can, can effectively just remove them from your game. And you need to be careful about that. Particularly in these last few weeks, balancing, as my GSI for 494, Isaiah Hines, used to say, balancing is when a, an okay game becomes great, okay? Or in other words, the distance between an okay game, you know, it's, it's all right, it's not very engaging, and an incredible game is often very small, okay? It can be as simple as a few tweaked numbers that have been tweaked through many playtests uh, to provide and generally end with a, a good player experience, okay? Decisions that happen regularly with good pacing that matter. So balancing can do that for you sometimes. Okay, let's keep going. I, I want a quick note on deliverables. So um, at this point in the semester, it isn't uncommon for some games to be in a bit of a rough spot. And I hope, you know, if you watch your video feedback, we released it at like 4 a.m. last night. It was a long night. Um, uh, I think some of the, your teams will see that, right? Uh, we're, not, we're not being very shy about it anymore. Um, some games are maybe a little bit behind, and, and maybe yours is. Don't give up hope, okay? 
there is a lot of potential left. There's a lot of time left. You can accomplish a lot in two weeks, okay? And so don't give up hope. A lot of games are so close, but there are just a few things that are kind of holding them back and getting in the way. Uh, and sometimes, like I just said, the effort needed to change a few things to just totally uh, fix your balancing issues, make your game make sense, it's, it's smaller than you think, okay? Uh, so don't give up. Who knows? The next change, the next task on your JIRA to-do list could be the one. It could be the one that changes, changes the entire experience, okay? Or really makes it click. One thing you'll find if you, if you read uh, interviews with indie devs is that oftentimes, oftentimes indie devs will have a game. They'll have a small game that they've been working on, and it doesn't really quite work until they do one tiny change that they didn't really think would make a big impact, but just absolutely shocked them with how much it changed the game and how engaging it made it. So don't give up hope. Keep fighting, all right? We believe in you. We'll be behind you. Um, be sure to reach out to us or ask quest questions on Piazza if you need any advice, okay? We're here for you. Okay, uh, so if you want to study game dev after the semester, I understand registration's open. You've heard about some of these courses before. I want to quick recap on them. Eeks X55, the Wolverine Soft Studio, is a really, really great opportunity. You can earn credits one to four. You get to choose how many credits, and that controls how much time you have to give to the studio. Uh, you earn credits in a large portfolio game because you're going to be working on a team of 20 to 30 other students making a big project. This semester, we essentially made a nuclear clone style game. I think it's called Nuclear Drone, actually. Um, and uh, so if, you, if you're if you interested in this, we got a form for you. You can register it here. I'll, I'll post this into the, uh, the agenda or the schedule pretty soon. Um, EX499, if you're interested in exploring uh, some sort of esoteric or bleeding edge game dev um, kind of field, right? So, okay, how can we apply machine learning? Um, how can we uh, uh, do other stuff, right? How can we how can we gamify music education? That's what Ishwar did. Um, then you can take this course, uh, 499 section 210, uh, for one to four credits and, uh, and continue your exploration of game development and uh, build out your portfolio more. So you can register your interest there as well. I encourage you to do so if you're interested, okay? So um, Facebook uh, Showcase Advertising has begun in earnest, which is super exciting. Uh, and I think we're actually a bit ahead of the game, though it might not look like it. Um, the EEX 494 plus EMU Showcase has this Facebook event. Uh, and we happen, we take place at 494showcase.com on the 8th, okay? The evening of the 8th. Um, please share this with your friends and family uh, when we post this. Uh, they, they really want to see all the fantastic efforts you put in this semester. Uh, and we want you to have the biggest impact uh, that you can, okay? Um, so anyway, please consider uh, checking this out and sharing it. Uh, we will have more information just for you on the showcase, explaining like when you need to arrive, what you need to do during the showcase, and what you need to provide to us before the showcase so we can advertise your game. Um, we'll give all that to you in, in the coming weeks, okay? Don't worry about that too much. Okay, interestingly, with your next deliverable, P3 Beta. If you look at the rubric on Canvas, you'll see that the Elements of Professionalism Guide, which we talked about a little bit earlier in the course, now matters. Okay, It, it has an impact on your grade. Um, so you need to read through this guide again, uh, and you need to have things like you need to have background audio, you need to have, have sound effects, you need to have scene transitions in your game. So it's not just you touch something, burp, right? just burp, pop into the next scene. It looks really jarring. It, it looks very amateurish. Uh, and, and you're not amateurs, um, so uh, we gotta we gotta get some of these things in. If you want scene transition code, it's in the course repo right here. It's it looks pretty nice. It works pretty well. Um, it's the kind that allows you to specify an image and have the 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 uh, screen transition kind of go like whoop, show the image whoop, and then come out whoop, show the image whoop, full screen. Uh, so it's pretty cool. We got some questions. Um, Okay, will you be sending out any responses to the 499 interest form or is it the next step to register for the course? Yes. So we will be sending out messages to everyone who registers for the Wolverine Soft Studio or for the 499 directed research course um, on this uh, these forms. And essentially what we'll be telling you to do is fill out a couple applications and then we will talk about your research idea uh, and then we will um, 
get you registered on, on Wolverine Access. If you want to register right now, you can do so. You can search for 499. You have to click the Include Independent Study uh, checkboxes uh, on the search form, but you can you can find it and register if you want to. Okay, uh, let's keep going. So the big one for today is going to be the P3 Marketing Draft. This is an assignment that you really haven't done before. Okay, uh, this is an assignment that involves taking the game that you now have, essentially recording footage, and putting that footage together to create a good experience for your audience. Okay, you've got a 45 second experience that you need to create for them, and this experience must accomplish a couple things. This experience has to accomplish a couple things. You need to have a hook, okay? Your trailer needs to have a hook to it. As in, the first part of your trailer, whether that's five seconds or 10 seconds or two seconds, it needs to do something surprising that players aren't necessarily expecting or that viewers aren't expecting. The reason you need this is because you need to grab the viewer's attention before they click away. The viewers will, they will bail instantly if you do not Get their, get their attention somehow. So a hook can be anything surprising or weird or interesting. Um, and we'll see a few examples of some good hooks uh, a little bit later, okay? Once you've got your user hooked, you need to spend a bit of time explaining what you are offering them, okay? The what. Players, oftentimes audiences can't really, they, they struggle to appreciate what they're looking at if they don't understand what you're selling them, right? Selling them. So, okay, you've hooked them. Now you need to explain what is this. And this is often where the pitch for your game comes in. Super Mario Brothers is a 2D side-scrolling action-adventure title in which you must explore the Mushroom Kingdom, jump over crazy obstacles, and rescue uh, your friend from the clutches of the evil Bowser, right? Um, that is where a, a, a pitch, a voice can come in. A narrator can come in. Uh, and do a really good job there. This is also typically showing basic gameplay footage and mechanics. So when your voiceover says, as Mario, jump over the obstacles, uh, you would sh want to show some footage of your character jumping over some various obstacles, right? And then the why. At the very end of the trailer, you want to show your best and most interesting gameplay footage, okay? The player is, got, you've got the player's attention, the player understands what you are selling them, but now you must prove to them that there are still surprises in store, that what you are selling is special, okay? And this is where you say, it's not just a 2D platformer, like all the rest. This is the craziest 2D platformer you've ever seen, where you can get a fire flower, you can combine that with a jump, you could throw a fireball in midair to take out an enemy, and then combo your jump onto several and get points and a life at the end of it. Right, that's where you want to show your best footage. So that players want to explore. They think, wow, wow, I got I to gotta know what's in this game. I got to know the mystery here. And then you leave them wanting more. Essentially, the why is you leave the player wanting more. You give them a reason to want to play. The why they should go play right now, okay? Anyway, um, what I want to do is I want to actually give you some additional tips and logistical tips on how to create these trailers because we haven't really gone over that a whole lot. In this course, I assume you've become used to kind of learning some stuff on your own, um, and we'll need to do a little bit more of that. However, Ishwar is going to teach you in the discussion coming up, I believe on Friday, how to acquire and then use uh, Adobe Premiere uh, for some editing uh, uh, knowledge, okay? So let's go ahead, and I want to, uh, I want to, I want to quickly mention the date here. So, um, these two assignments, your P3 beta and your P3 marketing draft, I'm willing to bet a number of your teams have worked on this a bit already. And that's good news because on Saturday, your Thanksgiving break starts. A break, right? Oh, you get to relax. You get to chill out a little bit, get some sleep, catch up on your other courses. Uh, hopefully they haven't given you homework. Um, we do not want you working over this break, okay? We want you relaxing. We want you refreshed. We want you... We want you hungry for these final few uh, weeks of 494 when we get back from break. So if I recall, and you know what, let's go ahead and, and grab the schedule here. We're going to bring our schedule on down. Okay, so here's our schedule, team. Ooh, we got to load. Okay, here's our schedule. All right, we're right here. Uh, well, no, actually, we're right here on Wednesday. Okay, so we've got P3 beta you're thinking about and P3 marketing draft. 
Now, you've got until Saturday before your break starts. Ideally, you get as much done on Saturday as you can, by Saturday. And then you have until the uh, 30th before we come back, break ends, you are back and you are working hard, okay? Um, so your P3 beta is not gonna be due until Monday the 30th when you come back from break and your P3 marketing draft won't be due then either. Um, and what this means is that if you need to, you can work a little bit after break, during break, but we really, we really want you to keep working hard until about Saturday. And then we want you to take a uh, take a rest. Don't think about 494 very much. It'll don't worry. It'll build your hunger. Ideas will come to you as you think about other stuff and relax. Um, and then on Monday, you got to have your stuff turned in. We're going to do more play testing. And then you have your final deliverables, P3 gold. And then you're gonna you're gonna polish up and give a final draft of your trailer uh, uh, for Monday. Okay. And then on the eighth, like uh, basically a week after you come back from break. Showcase time, all right? The last day of class is effectively your last day of 494. We have no exams in this course. We just have a final short post-mortem assignment for you to do with your team. Uh, and you have to eval your, uh, your team as well. And then that's it. Uh, you, can, uh, you can take all the study days and exam days and focus on your other courses. You can rest up, uh, and that's it. We'll have your grades back to you, hopefully within a, a week or two after the showcase, your final grades, okay? <clears throat> Anyway, um, so that's how the schedule is going for these assignments. Uh, there's going to be temptation to stop working now because you know it's not due until the 30th. That would be a disastrous idea because our expectations are not slowing down simply because you had a long break. In fact, they're probably going up a little bit. So please put in a really good effort until Saturday and then boom, submit to Canvas and take a nice break. Then as Monday and the end of break arrives, Play your game a bit, maybe fix some bugs, uh, and then you're good, okay? All right. So I've got some trailer production tips for you. You are going to be making these video trailers, and you'll want to use the free software that is available to you, and you'll want to use Ishwar's help as well, the video coming Friday. You, have, you should have a Final Cut Pro, Adobe Premiere, and some other piece of software available to you, even though you can't access the Deuterstat Center. Um, and so... Uh, I believe Ishwar, Ishwar, can you can you post the link in the chat to the um, to the the free UMich version of Adobe Premiere so students can download it now. Um, there are also other softwares too. One of them is OpenShot, uh, which is a, a, you know it's an okay kind of bare bones video editor. It's not bad. Um, it used to crash a lot. OpenShot is kind of a Windows Movie Maker replacement if you ever used Movie Maker way back when you were young. Um, Canned Break is an open source piece of software for converting between different file formats and video files, audio files, all that can be useful. Um, OBS is what you've been using already. It's, hey, it's great software when it comes to recording footage. And so I recommend that you use it to record a bunch of interesting footage and then you can kind of bring that in where it works into your trailer, okay? Um, another thing to consider though is that when you're recording footage, you really don't want to have stuff like UI in it, in many cases, okay? And so what you'll want to do is you'll want to think about, okay, what can we do to make our trailer footage look really, really great? And so uh, from some experience at The Sims, on The Sims 4 team, which was like 300 people strong, we actually had an entire team dedicated just to making trailers and marketing material. This team would come to me as one of the new members of the, the Sims 4 development team, and they would essentially ask to be given cheat codes. They would ask for cheat codes that would disable UI. They would ask for cheat codes that would cause a certain character to have their emotes or their motives fill back up. So, hey, Austin, we need this character to suddenly have a bladder problem right in the middle of this shot, right? We need a way to like schedule that and control that. And so that's what we did. We built out cheat codes and technologies for the video team because it was really important that we made a good first impression. Everyone, listen to this, okay? Unfortunately, many people who come to the showcase, they're not going to play your game. Believe it or not, and as sad as that is, they're not going to play your game. What they're going to do is they're going to watch your trailer and they're going to kind of get the gist of your game from that and they're going to vote on that, okay? And that might be parents who don't play a lot of games but are still interested in, in seeing all the games out there. 
All right, seeing the footage, getting a feel for how each one works. That might be professors who don't play a whole lot of games or don't have a lot of time. It could be someone who's super busy, right? And they're just going to see your trailer. If you show your portfolio site to a recruiter or an interviewer, there's a chance they might not download your game. Hey, I can't download your game. I mean, I'm on a corporate machine. I, I'd have to get permission from IT. It could be a security risk, right? But I'll watch your trailer, right? Trailer's only 45 seconds long. That's the maximum length it can be. And it, it can get across a lot of things about your game. It can show off impressive technical aspects. It can show off the story and thought you've put into your game in terms of context. It can show off the unique traits of your game, how different mechanics combine to do really surprising and interesting things, right? To help players get past obstacles that they couldn't otherwise. Um, so think about that, all right? These trailers, they're not worth as many points as a final gold deliverable, but in terms of impact into your future, might be one of the most valuable things you do in this course. So put in some effort, okay? Put in that effort, allocate that time, dedicate an entire person maybe to doing this. Uh, on your team, or maybe even two. And, uh, and and I don't think you'll regret it. I don't think you'll regret it, team. Okay, so let's keep going. Um, this, this year, it's going to be really hard to get to a recording booth and get a crystal clear, articulate voiceover, okay? It's very obvious when you have a trailer that has been kind of a dubbed with a subpar microphone or without removing sound uh, and noise uh, in Audacity. And so what I recommend that you do is I recommend you take us up on that voice actor extra credit assignment from a few weeks ago and um, find someone with a really good microphone and a really clear, articulate, strong voice in exactly the tone and character that you want and ask them to do your voiceover, right? Write up a script, okay? Ask them to do your voiceover. They'll send you some files, hopefully. Uh, hopefully pretty soon, pretty quickly. Uh, and then you'll have a really clear, articulate voiceover and you'll just stand out above the pack. Um, uh, it, it, this has worked extremely well in the past and I'm telling you, it will be very obvious if you recorded this like in your noisy uh, you know, living room uh, with a, a microphone that wasn't really meant for audio, okay? So anyway, go out there and find a voice actor and get some extra credit while you're at it, all right? Okay, so what makes a good trailer? You already know about this. The hook gets their attention, makes them notice. The what explains and, and kind of deconfuses people, right? Explains what you're selling uh, so that the, the user can have the satisfaction of kind of knowing what they're getting into with this game. Uh, if, the, if your user is watching your trailer and then starts going, ah, ah, yes, ah, eureka, eureka, I understand what you're getting at, that's really good. And then the why, now that they know what's going on, you need to shock them. You need to give them this feeling that there's more under the hood, right? More they don't understand. They got to play the game to find out more, right? Um, so this can also work as a very nice climax. Some uh, trailers will, they'll show you the game and they'll show you some cool stuff. And then at the very end of the trailer, they'll flash in like the final boss's form or something, right? To see like, ooh, 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 ooh. you think you know it's coming. Viewer, you do not. You have to play the game. Um, so it's a little it's a little hook on the end there if you think about it. Okay, so I want to show you some examples. And then chat, what we're going to do is we're going to quickly say, okay, what is what is the hook, what is the what, and what is the why? And how do these trailers do this, okay? So let's take a look at these trailers and see how it goes. I'm going to need you, chat. So get, get, uh, get ready at the keyboard, all right? Okay, so our first game is called Color Wars. Let's take a look. In Color Wars, you must pass before you can score. Steal the ball. Block your opponents. Clear the path. Outplay the enemy. First to three wins the game. Color Wars. All right. Okay, everyone. Uh, so, how did, uh, what did you think? What was the hook here? What would you say the hook was, chat?
right? This is a trailer that, that really does uh, uh, feel very polished, and it, it gives a very clear idea of what the game is, and it makes you want to play it. So the question is, how did they manage this? we got to dissect it so we can take their techniques and stand on the shoulders of giants, right? hooked with their flashy graphical effects. Bingo, bingo. And their music, their music, right? Let's watch the, the very beginning of this. Title card. Boom, boom, boom. In boom, color boom. Right. You must pass. Okay, so the trailer immediately, as, as the chat was saying, starts off with some flashy action, right? It's not super confusing. You can kind of understand that it's a competitive uh, game, but you got this flash, you got the music coming in powerfully, you got... Uh, this team working together and scoring a points, players exploding, and then this voiceover comes in where color wars, where you pass before you can score, before you can score, right? And then the what comes in. The trailer said, "Okay, we got them hooked now. Now we have to under we have to make them understand what this thing is. Otherwise, they'll be confused and they'll walk away." Okay. So how does the trailer chat? Do you remember how the trailer makes the mechanics clear? And I also want you to take a note of this footage. Chat, what do you notice about this footage? It's not zoomed out, right? But it's zoomed in. It's showing you exactly what the narrator talks about. Right? It's cropped in. Well, I don't know if it's cropped necessarily. They might have taken their in-game camera and moved it closer. The problem with cropping and then zooming is that you get really fuzzy footage that can look really low quality if you... Uh, record it in low resolution. So what happens is, after the hook, the trailer, the narrator, goes in explaining the three core mechanics. You can pass. You can steal the ball. You can block shots, right? You have to pass before you can score, right? First to three wins. Steal the ball. And it shows the steal happening. It showed the steal. Block your opponents. Block your opponents. It shows, right? Clear the path. It shows your teammate getting rid of the wall, right? So that you can score. Outplay the enemy. First to three wins the game. And then, and then the why. It shows you just some raw footage of teams doing cool stuff, right? Color wars. Yeah, so they, they have the narrator say something, but then they also bring in some text in a really elegant way. You want to avoid too much text in your trailer, aside from the ending and beginning cards, which you're required to have um, with all the credits for all your people and your freelancers. Um, but this is just a, a spectacular trailer. The only thing I think might be a little bit weak is the why. Like at the very at the very end, the footage is cool, but it's not crazy, right? Um so let's watch, let's look at another example, chat. You did a good job. You did a good job. Um, let's go ahead and see if you can get this one, though. Okay, this one is called Breakdown. Let's take a look. Avoid falling to a fiery death while trying to send other players to theirs in this action-packed, four-player, five-round free-for-all fight for survival. Encircle other players and watch the platform disintegrate underneath them. Try to avoid conflict and play the edge of the map. Collect power-ups to give yourself a tactical advantage. Dodge hazardous obstacles dropped by passing aliens. In a fight to survive, there are no rules. Battle it out and break it down. All right, chat, let's hear it. What's your diagnosis, chat? Uh, uh oh, we went to, uh, I need to pause it here. What's, what's the technique, chat? What did they do, okay? How about the hook? How do they grab your attention right away? And I think you'll notice something in common. The hook is kind of in common with the with the last game, uh, the last game's hook, right? What do you got, chat? Let's go, come on, we don't have too much time. You know, I, I know this is a, a very tired and, and fatigued part of the, the semester. My coach used to always say in, in track and cross country, the first half of the workout is to get you tired, right? 
to get you mentally exhausted, to get you physically exhausted. And the second half of the workout is where you grow and you get strong, right? Pushing yourself beyond your limits. Uh, and so we need to we need to put in a big effort now uh, uh, when we're when we're even when we're a little bit tired. We got to make it happen. That's where we're gonna get stronger. Um, okay, hook. Okay. So the first thing, thank you, chat. The sun seems like they're flashy graphics. They want it front and center for the hook. Bingo, right? Not a whole lot of 494 games have a beautiful sun, like falling apart structure right in front of you. Boom, right in your face when you start. It's a really, it's, it's interesting. It's visually engaging. You wonder, what's going on here? We're in space, stuff's falling apart, whoa. Um, showing the sun with falling blocks. Hook is showing the blocks falling at the beginning. Yes. All right, let's watch. Look at that beautiful shader. That's a beautiful shader. Then we move on to the what. So now the team's like, okay, now we have to explain what's going on here, what we're selling. The only thing that makes me sad about this next part is that this UI, like this UI up here in each corner is not important to the to people watching. Like they don't have any context for this UI. They don't even know power-ups are in the game. And so I really wish the team had disabled this UI when they recorded this footage, okay? But let's let's keep watching. Listen listen for what the narrator says and shows on the gameplay footage. Avoid falling to a fiery death while trying to send other players to theirs in this action-packed four-player, five-round free-for-all fight for survival. Encircle other players and watch the platform disintegrate underneath them. Try to avoid conflict and play the edge of the map. Collect power-ups to give yourself a tactical advantage. Dodge hazardous obstacles dropped by passing aliens. So that was the what, right? The middle part of the trailer, right? And what did they do? Well, they said, they, they gave the gist of it, right? Hey, send other people to their, their fiery death and avoid yours, right? Stay up on the platforms. And then, like in three pieces, it said, encircle other players to send them to their doom. And it shows, the footage shows you a very clear example of one player cutting off another player and them falling, right? Play the edge of the map and, and, and be safe, right? And it shows a player way off on the side trying to avoid everyone, right? Gather power-ups to get yourself an edge. And it shows players racing toward a power-up, one player getting it, and then using that power-up to jump, right? It's kind of interesting. In this game, jumping is a power-up, right? Because it allows you to get over a gap and escape an island you were about to be trapped on. So, and then at the very end, what does it give us? In a fight to survive, there are no rules. Battle it out and break it down. That was the why. At the very end there, and it's interesting, it's a little bit different than the previous uh, uh, game trailer because it actually uh, uses a play on words, right? So, you know, fight to survive, battle it out or break it down, right? And it returns to the title. It's like a full circle, uh, which makes it a very satisfying line to end on. And it also, like the previous footage, it shows off some cool footage of a competition happening and people falling. Uh, so uh, that's another fantastic trailer. Uh, well done, chat. Let's look at, uh, I want to look at only a couple more and then we'll get to AI and um, uh, uh, games, okay? This is, these trailers are really important though. And everyone, pay, pay mind, okay? You will be showing these off. The entire course will be uh, watching these trailers, okay? Uh, when you return. Uh, so, and we'll be giving you feedback, okay? So this one uh, is called Steal the Spotlight. Let's take a look. This one has a little bit of an interest, uh, a different approach to it than the other two trailers, okay? So watch for the, the, the hook, okay? The what and the why. Two duets. The Rose Sisters. And the Forget-Me-Nots. Both these groups love to sing. But there can only be one. Play as dueling duets and collect spotlight to light up your stage. Hit. Hook. Dash. And pass. Do you have what it takes? To steal the spotlight. All right, chat, what's the word? What did they do? And I think you should notice immediately that they did something very interesting, particularly at the beginning of this trailer. What did they do? What did they do, chat? What do you got?
Well, they did have some zoom ins, sure, um, and a little bit of cropping. But did this did this trailer start with just stock gameplay footage? Ooh, they used a scratch and they changed the tone. A shift in tone can be really effective. So this trailer is really unique in that it doesn't start with gameplay footage. It actually starts with the narrative and context first, okay? So yeah, it tells a story, right? Two duets, the Rose Sisters, and it introduces these characters and they're at a stage and it looks like they're singing, right? And then you've got the forget-me-nots, right? Setting up the characters and the context. They are a bunch of divas uh, and they are walking to be friends. They both love music. I bet they're best friends, right? The tone is super like happy and, um, and kind of co uh, uh, harmonious. And then suddenly, suddenly you hear this. Love to sing. <laughs> right? The, the tone starts off very hafty, happy and there's a, an abrupt and comedic shift to, wait a second, they're, they're arch rivals, right? But there can only be one. And there can only be one, and then, then one of them hits the other. It's, 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 it's pretty comedic, and that shift is really satisfying for the user. It gets their attention, right? The trailer then shows some footage. It then zooms in Play to show individual mechanics, and right? spotlight to light up your stage. It tells us what the objective is. Hit. So you can hit, right? Hook. You can steal the ball, right, with the pass. hook. You can dash, you can pass. And pass. Right? Do you have what it takes to... So it gets the hook out of the way with some story. It spends a lot of its time on story, actually, at the beginning. The hook gets a lot of time. And then the what section in the middle shows off each mechanic and how you can use them. And then at the very end, um, the... Uh, yeah, and the spotlight turning on at the beginning also gets your attention. At the very end, you've got this really cool animation where it's sort of like a... I feel like this this reminds me of anime or something. you got the characters flying at each other. Uh, and there you go. Steal the spotlight. Right? So uh, the Y here might be considered a little bit weak at the end, but it does get your attention again. It shows you a bit of polish with these cool narrative elements going. Right? People flying at each other. Um... So anyway, another great trailer, uh, and we'll look at one more, and I hope this is one of the live action trailers, otherwise I'll have to show you one more. Okay. Oh, it, it doesn't. I'm going to show you one more trailer uh, at the end here, okay? The fight for fish, a builder's revolution. Capture the opponent's fish. Are you ready for flip? and Flap versus Bill and Jill. Grab the red fish if you're on the blue team, or grab the blue fish if you're on the red team. There's a new fortification stage. You fortify your fish with snow blocks. Now, fight your way to capture the opponent's fish. Stop your opponent. Fight for fish. All right, so another pretty good trailer. I'll let you think about the hooks in this one. Um, I want to show you. Oh, what what what's? Oh, I, I wonder. I wonder where it is. Where's okay? There's a super cheesy trailer called Spooky Spider. I think you might have seen it already. I'm gonna show you uh, one trailer that uses like live recorded footage to great effect. It's extremely cheesy, um, but as you'll find out, cheese is on the menu when it comes to these these trailers in this context, okay? Um, let's do, uh, it's a game called Lights Out. And what a fantastic trailer this really is. Um, uh, can we watch this? Can we watch it? Is it gonna work? Yes, it will. Hold on. Firefox is being very strange Lights. right now. Okay, let's let this load up, lights out. And then, you know, we might take an early break uh, just uh, to make our transition into AI a little bit smoother. So Lights Out is a game about a 2D light bulb as you're exploring this house and trying to restore power. The light bulb has some unique teleportation mechanics that make the game pretty interesting from a navigational traversal perspective. Um, and the trailer makes a really, really good first impression 
by using a, a very uh, a kind of heavy effort technique that is also extremely fun and, uh, and humorous. Let's take a look at this trailer. Lights Out, the story of a small light bulb on a big mission. You must traverse through the dark house in this adventure puzzle-solving platformer. Use your powers of electricity to access hard-to-reach places, defeat enemies, and light up the house. Solve puzzles to collect gears and open new areas. Along your journey, you can meet all types of enemies, but what could be lurking in the basement? Make your way through the dark in Lights Out. What a fantastic trailer. It's full circle, right? So the, the narration ends by saying the, the title of the game in a very natural way. Um, it starts, how it starts is, is very incredible and unique. It starts with real life footage outside of, I believe, a, a sorority house uh, with some light bulbs. And they actually, they actually imply that one of these light bulbs is the main character of the game, right? Uh, so uh, they also, I believe, had a really great camera too uh, uh, for this. But anyway, um, don't underestimate the power of doing a little bit of cheesy acting yourself. Uh, you know, I know you can't go outside. I know you can't really be with your team. Uh, but uh, mixing up uh, different kinds of footage like this, uh, bringing it into the real world, can be a very effective way to grab someone's attention immediately. Okay, It's often very unexpected because not a lot of teams do it. Uh, so think about that. Um, another thing you can think about is usage of audio in the classic Buccaneer booty battle. I'll just play a second of it so you can remember. Among the seven seas there lie a dark and desolate cove. The home to such a scary fright you'd never thought you'd know. This is so high effort that you cannot help but hear this and just your eyes are glued to the trailer. You can't believe what you're what you're watching. I know I couldn't believe it when I first saw this trailer. Just incredible work. Anyway, music can be a very, very big part of setting a tone and giving your trailer a sense of timing, as I believe we talked about a few months ago when the, the course began, okay? So anyway, that's all I essentially want to tell you about making these trailers. Um, it's a, it is a tough thing to do. It's gonna take a lot of time. Uh, however, it is worth the effort. Once you have a great trailer, you can reuse it essentially forever. You can put it in portfolios, you can use it of course at the showcase, you can use it at job interviews, you can use it to look back on the, the awesome stuff you did in college. Uh, so I encourage you to, uh, to, to put your effort into these trailers. I, I believe they are fairly hefty in value. I think they're about 25 points, uh, at least the final one is. But anyway, if you have any questions about this or need any ideas, uh, be sure to hit us up and, and and uh, we'd, we'd be happy to share some ideas. We can also share a lot more trailers with you too if you want more examples of things that have been done. Okay, so what I want to do is I want to turn the music on. We're going to give it about five minutes uh, break, and we're going to come back with a discussion on games and AI. And I'll need your help chat on this topic as well because we're going to play some games against some AI agents. We're going to see how it goes, okay? We're going to see if, uh, if there's hope for humanity here against the robot menace. Uh, so let's uh, let's go ahead and get that get that done. Okay. See you in five, everyone. Feel free to ask any questions if you have any about grading or about the course or anything like that. I also have a little announcement. Uh, evals are are out. I think it's very early in the course uh, uh, still for that kind of thing. But I believe the final evals are out. Uh, so if you have thoughts about the course, if you have ideas, most importantly, if you have ideas on how we can improve it for future semesters, uh, then please uh, invest a little bit of time. Uh, and uh, and uh, and send your ideas our way. Okay, we really appreciate it. It's it's the way that we improve the course from semester to semester. We need more ideas uh, because we've we burned through a lot of the obvious ones. Um, also, you get extra credit for doing this. If the, uh, the the more people participate, the participation rate in the course as it goes up, you get more and more points with I think a maximum of ten. Uh, if everyone does the does the the extra credit, okay. So make sure, uh, if, make sure everyone does these evals and make sure you do yours, okay? We appreciate it. Uh, thank you for investing back into our course. Okay, uh, let's get some music going. Everybody, there's a new king in town. Get ready. Mojo, 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 king, baby!
Oh yeah. So can you um, uh, Lepet Uh, can you can you let me know what game you're talking about? So dizziness can be caused by a number of things. Uh, motion blur can cause dizziness. Uh, camera cuts that are too sharp and quick can cause dizziness. Um, and if you're if you have a first person game, then not having a reticle or icon in the center of your screen can cause motion sickness as well. Um, people who don't have who just never play games, I believe, are also a little bit more vulnerable to experiencing motion sickness. Ah, the Inside Man. You're gonna want to check. I, I don't recall if that game in the first person mode has a reticle in the center or not. But, but often that can help a lot, even if it's a faint circle. Even if it's that simple, it can help. Mirror's Edge. Mirror's Edge, if you look at that game, it's a first-person parkour game. They have the option of turning off a tiny red dot in the center of your screen. And if you turn that off, I found myself having motion sickness within like 30 minutes of playing. Um, with, if you turn the reticle back on, it's like, oh, no big deal. It, it is very strange. VR, VR uh, developers are having, that, that is kind of, a, I think, a constant struggle for VR developers. And they've devised new techniques to try and um, deal with the idea of motion sickness. Um, one of the int interesting techniques that uh, VR developers will use to combat motion sickness when, when you see yourself move in a VR game, but you don't feel those forces acting upon you, if you don't feel the acceleration uh, uh, on your real life body, and you won't because you're not moving in real life, right? Then that can cause a lot of motion sickness. And so what developers will sometimes do is when you want to warp somewhere, when you want to change your location, sometimes the developers will, will fade your screen to black really quickly. Like, boop, black, okay, warp you, open back up. Or in other words, it's it's sort of like you do a blink every time you move, um, and I, that seems to help a bit. Gosh, I remember the first time I remember the first time I played VR. I was playing a, a, a VR like first-person Pac-Man game, and I was being chased in a really intense uh, uh, gameplay scenario uh, by these these ghosts. Right, so I was swerving. I was going around. It's like, oh my gosh, this is, this is crazy. Right, I'm engaged. Uh, okay, I gotta go that way. No, this goes that way. Turn around, quick, go that way. All right, all right, duck, duck, there are two coming. All right, down this hallway. It was extremely intense, and I loved it until about five minutes had passed, at which point I started to feel really bad. I started to get sweaty. I started to, to, to lose my sense of space a little bit. I take this headset off. I go home, and I, 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 I go to sleep, and I wake up feeling bad. I remember I felt bad for like two days straight after that experience, and I never wanted to put on a VR goggle headset again. Um, kind of a sad, sad situation. I, maybe I would do more stuff in VR if I didn't have that early visceral reaction to it. Okay, that has been five minutes, everyone. Let's get back to it. Okay, so uh, I want to talk about AI and games, all right? AI is an extremely interesting topic and an extremely impactful one in 2020. Uh, artificial intelligence is making massive strides, and there are kind of new technologies and techniques that have emerged in the last decade uh, to help AI become more general, more flexible, and more impactful in many different areas of life. Um, and so uh, I, I, I think you may have noticed, right? Uh, companies these days, investors, VCs, um, teachers, all, you know, the news all talk about AI being applied to different places from Uber and self-driving to facial recognition. There's a lot of controversy. There's a lot of advancement happening. Uh, and so there's a very good chance that as you go on to your careers in the industry, as you go on to uh, careers in academia, 
But if you go to grad school, there's a very good chance that you will, if not be working directly with AI, you'll be affected by it and you'll be thinking about it, okay? Um, so let's go ahead and, and get, get rolling. Okay. Oopsie. So we started at the very beginning. Let's not do that. Okay. So, video games and AI. Does anyone know what this is right here? A number of your games use this. Uh, and, and hold on, let me go ahead and get this resized really quickly. Uh, uh, we had to change the size of this uh, scene in OBS for Mainichi, if you recall. Um, okay, so we're back and uh, it's gonna kind of go away here. Cool. Okay. So uh, you've seen this before, probably. You've seen something like this. This is a pathfinding technique. And in particular, this is, in fact, a star. Well done, Lepitzkorth. Uh, Le Le That's a hard name to say. Um, and so I want to talk to you about, first, classical AI. Okay, Who has played this game before? Has anyone played this? Anyone played this game? This is a popular game known, of course, as Number Place. This game first emerged as number place in uh, 19th century France. And uh, the basic rules of it we'll get to in a second, but you probably know this game as Sudoku. It was popularized by a company called Nikoli uh, in Tokyo. Uh, it was massively popular, and it started appearing in magazines and papers worldwide. Uh, and it eventually got, of course, into digital games. Uh, one of the famous examples being Nintendo's Brain Age in the early stages of the uh, early life of the Nintendo 3D, uh, 3D uh, no, Nintendo DS. Okay. Um, now this game, right? The rules are you want to fill each of these empty cells with a number. Okay. If you can fill the entire board with numbers, then you won. However, there are some constraints. You can't just choose any number you want to place into these empty cells. Every single column across this entire board needs to have a unique value. So if you look at this column right here, there's a one, there's an eight, and a four. So you can't use these three numbers again. But you can use a number, for instance, three or two, because they don't appear in this column yet. You have to do the same thing with rows. So they have to all have unique values horizontally across this board as well. And within these uh, three by three little blocks, right, uh, these nine cell blocks, they must also have unique numbers. Okay, so you're, you're satisfying these three constraints as best you can uh, by figuring out what numbers you want to put where, all right? And that's some of the satisfaction, okay? You try out a number, wait, I can't do that. You try another number, can't do that. Try a number, that works, but wait a second, if I use that number, I can't use that number down here where I need it. So I need to go back and try a different thing, right? Um, this game has some interesting mathematical properties. Uh, this is an NP-complete problem. Uh, in the general case. It's very, very difficult and time-consuming for software to solve. However, we can brute force it anyway, because in almost all cases, we only care about this 9 by 9 formulation of the Sudoku problem. Uh, and so, well, I mean, the, the problem size isn't going to get any bigger, right? And so we can brute force it with, with uh, fast enough hardware, and we do, all right? So these 9 by 9 puzzles uh, are often solved via a technique called backtracking. Essentially, the technique is this. We're going to try out, it's not super complicated, uh, it's, it's kind, of, kind of greedy in a way. Uh, we're going to try out numbers and go through all of our numbers, and if a number works, we move on to the next cell. If we get to a point where none of our options will work, like there's no option we can choose, that means we've done a, an earlier part, a kind of subset of the problem incorrectly. And so we need to backtrack and go try a different number than the ones we chose earlier, and then come back and see if that changes our luck in the future, okay, on future problems. Here's a GIF that shows us trying to use backtracking to solve it. The thing to take note of here is that when it's solving, the early numbers don't change much. Like this two doesn't change very much, okay? But toward the frontier of choosing numbers, we get a lot of back and forth. And sometimes we have to go all the way back. That two got changed to a four, okay? So you try out numbers, and when nothing works, you go back until you find something that you can change, okay? And then you go forward, and then you go back to something you can change. And if you can't change anything, you just keep going back, all right? And that's how it works. This takes quite a bit of time. It's not very efficient, but that doesn't matter. Computers and hardware are very fast these days, so we can solve them very quickly. Um, 
So uh, depth first search, right? This is essentially depth first search. You are searching through the space of possibilities and you're, you're going as deep as you can, as fast as you can. And then when you reach a dead end, you go backward up this uh, possibility tree uh, and choose a different option and keep going back down. Try and go as deep as you can, okay? Until you get everything, every uh, cell filled and every constraint uh, not violated, okay? However, this kind of technique, it's a classical search technique, right? It can be very fragile and it's not flexible. Uh, you can design a Sudoku board puzzle that is like purpose built to destroy this searching approach. Okay, um, this might look like an innocuous, you know, Sudoku board, but has, it has been specifically designed to mess with this backtracking depth first search algorithm to the point where, where most Sudoku puzzles will be solved in just like maybe second tops. This might take hours to solve, okay, because it has been sadistically designed uh, to mess with you and your algorithm, okay? In other words, we, we, have, we, have, we have AI that can solve certain problems, but very often our approaches, just they're very classic and they're very stiff and rigid. They're not flexible, they don't adapt uh, to changing circumstances, and they, they certainly don't find strategies that we don't know about, okay? If there are heuristics in like what number we should be choosing, then like we're not using them, okay? It's just a classical search, it's not, it's not very engaging or interesting, okay? Um, okay, so how about Connect4? Well, I want to show you the power of these algorithms all the same. Um, let's go ahead, and, and, and as it applies to game design, let's play Connect4, okay? Um, this game was designed by Milton Bradley in 1974. Uh, it's kind of like Sudoku in that you're trying to fill cells uh, 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 that are constrained in a way uh, before your, your, your opponent does. You need to create a four token line of your color to win. This line can be vertical, horizontal, or diagonal. Um, and the opponent can break your line by putting their token in uh, to get in your way. It's sort of like tic-tac-toe in that way, except larger and more fun. Um, may only choose a column in any given turn. You cannot choose a row because you can only drop your token in at the top. So you only ever choose which column you want and not which row. Um, and uh, let's, uh, well, let's give it a go, all right? So we're going to play against an AI opponent, chat, and I need your help. Okay, let's play a new game. And uh, that's a robot. Our opponent's going to be a robot. We're going to be red. Okay, we're red team. Okay, so chat, what, what row, what, what column do we choose? Do we choose column 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, or 7? What's the word, chat? What's our first drop going to be? Seven. Seven. All right. We're going straight to the end of the board. Seven. Boop. Okay. All right. What's uh, what's the next? Uh, what, oh, oh, wait a second. I'm sorry, chat. We lose in 19 moves. All right. Well, uh, chat, this didn't go very well. We, uh, we got one turn in before we, uh, we were guaranteed a loss. Okay, so let's uh, let's try again, chat. Let's maybe we don't choose seven next time. In fact, who who chose seven? Uh, no, that's okay. That's okay. All right. So what's the word, chat? Does everyone want to do four? Does does uh do, does everyone want to do four? All right, we got a four. We got Dingwall says four, so we're gonna do four. All right, one, two, three, four. We can win in twenty moves, team. All right, what's what's the word? What's our next play? Another four? Another four respect on a plate? All right, let's do it. Red can win in 19 moves. Royal Peaches wants a three. Okay, we lose in 17 moves. Thank you, uh, thank you, Peaches. <laughs> I'm just kidding. No, it's okay. Um, okay, so you can see that, you know, this game is not going super well for us, right? The AI, the AI opponent, right? And this is the kind of thing that you can imagine a company like putting on the back of the box, like brilliant new AI opponents to give you the most challenging experience, a Connect4 experience of your life, right? You, you can imagine this being advertised, right? We got this super great AI in our game. You're going to love it. But this game I, AI, as it turns out, it's so good that it kind of ruins the entire game for most players, unless you're an expert level player. And then you're so restricted in your movements that you can even make uh, to prevent to, to prevent uh, instant failure. 
um, that it's just not a good experience, right? And this this entire spiel is uh, is to point out something very interesting to you, right? This was not a fun experience, okay? But it shows us something that good game AI is often a less competent AI. In other words, good game AI is often not so great computer AI, right? You need to build in mediocrity and mistakes and humanness into your AI sometimes. Uh, you need to build in surprises. So maybe AI doesn't always do what you expect it to. Now this brings to mind, uh, on The Sims 4, one of the things that we had to do uh, for the AI the AI team was led by uh, uh, Rez Graham, I believe, one of my mentors, an awesome guy. Um, he engineered the Sims AI behavior so that sometimes, you know, the, the, the Sims always knew what was the most optimal way to get to a destination, right? You want the Sim to go to the other side of the house in order to get their, their pick up the phone, right? Well, the Sims always knew, the technology knew what was the optimal route the Sim should take, but it weighed that probabilistically because humans don't always do the optimal thing. Like sometimes humans will take weird routes to stuff because they were daydreaming or something or they just, I don't know, they, they were feeling off that day. And so there's a chance the sim will take like an, a suboptimal, you know, longer route than normal to your phone. And the result is a game that feels more human, feels a little bit more unpredictable, a little bit more surprising. Um, and it's just a lot more interesting and fun. Uh, for that particular genre, it works really well. Um, but so as scary as it is, AI can often beat us if it really wants to, and it can beat us bad, okay? It can just knock us out uh, very quickly. Um, and that's be because these classical search algorithms, like they have a finite amount of states that these games can be in, and you can literally search through every single state and every future, you can, you can, you can um, plan every possible future in a tree, right? With each option being a branch on that tree, you can look at what options, what routes take you to the victory condition at the very end. Um, and you can make the, uh, the most optimal routes. And when there's a route that your opponent cannot beat, cannot mess with, then you just take that route and you're guaranteed a victory, right? Anyway, chess is a, uh, a game that's a little bit more complicated than Connect 4. Uh, Way back in the day, I forget what, uh, this is the 90s, there's a famous computer called Deep Blue. Has anyone heard of Deep Blue? Chat, anyone heard of that? Deep Blue is a famous computer and maybe one of the first computers that really freaked humans out by beating humans at one of their own classic uh, games. So it was created in the 90s by IBM to challenge chess grandmasters. I believe it was mainly a kind of a PR thing. IBM wanted to be seen as the predominant tech, tech company of the future, so they, they built this fantastic device. Uh, it used, the funny thing is, as cool as this technology used, it used like purely brute force classical search. It, I don't believe it used very many heuristics, and I don't believe it used machine learning or anything like that. Um, it just, you know, it searched through the, the future space of the chess game, and it made its best guess as to what, what the best choice was, right? What what option has the most uh, victory outcomes at the end of the, the tree? And so it played 40 moves into the future, right? That's how deep the tree was from its current position in the tree. Um, and uh, it had no human emotion, so it never got flustered. It did crash a few times, which is pretty interesting. Um, but it, uh, it never got flustered. It never made a bold move. I mean, it just always made the move that it viewed as the most probable for a victory, right? It wasn't trying to to disrupt Gary, his his opponent. It wasn't trying to, you know, uh, its opponent, right? And it worked. It worked. It won. It beat the chess uh, champion Gary Kasparov uh, in the '90s. And the look at this crowd, right? Look at the reaction of the crowd. They cannot believe it. This person in the front is just is just amazed. These this person on the left looks amazed, but also vaguely concerned. Right? And, and the rest of the crowd is like, oh, eh, huh, what does it mean? <laughs> what does it mean for us as a species? What does it mean for the future? Right? Defeated the world champion, uh, Gary Kasparov, in 96 and 97. Um, so the, the power of classical approaches, it used to power, uh, you know, Deep Blue got it done with a classical search, which you might have learned in, in X492, right? another fantastic class. Um, and, uh, well, it's very powerful, right? Why can't we just search through the possibility space of any game? 
<laughs> okay, who knows what this game is? Then you might you might uh, you might know a problem. Um, you might see where this is going. Who knows what this game is? Um, this is a famous uh, Chinese game, uh, an ancient Chinese game, uh, that apparently uh, uh, the emperors and, and the generals of of, uh, of the ancient China would play to like practice strategy. It's it's pretty crazy. This is a game called Go. Okay. And when you think about the number of possibilities in chess, there are a lot of different states that the chess board can be in. But Go takes this kind of to another level. In fact, many new levels. Um, this is how many different board and state possibilities are in Go. Okay, um, I don't even know how to pronounce this number, but th that's a lot of zeros. Okay, I'm not going to count that for you. You can count that many. Yet. There are probably, I, I imagine there are more atoms in the observable universe uh, than there are uh, uh, or there, there are fewer atoms in the, the observable universe than there are states in the game of Go, okay? And uh, this is a problem for classical search because if you're using a search tree, right, a data structure that kind of helps you figure out where you want to go and where you want to look, and if you're traversing that tree, like you don't have enough memory, you don't have enough time to store that thing and that data structure and to traverse that tree. Uh, classical search is just going to fail, okay? It's going to fail hard. Um, however, what's interesting is that these days, this is not necessarily the blockade that it used to be. Um, Google has made headlines uh, big time lately uh, for their AlphaGo AI, which has been winning matches. It has been winning matches against some of the best players in the world, right? Um, uh, Google's AlphaGo defeats uh, Chinese Go Master and win for AI. Google defeats the AI uh, a human uh, Go champion, uh, right? Um, and so the question is, well, this can't be classical search. This can't be a classical AI approach. So what? what is it, right? Even heuristics wouldn't be good enough to trim this uh, massive uh, number down. Probably wouldn't be. So what are they doing? Well, Oh gosh, this is this is a crazy article, right? This is very dramatic. Go champion retires after realizing, realizing AI is an entity that cannot be defeated. That's that's like uh, that's that's making me a little bit nervous. There, I feel like I'm entering into a uh, into a, a, a technological dystopia horror movie. Might not be that off. Let's uh, let's keep going. New horizons with machine learning. Okay, so classical approach might be out, but what takes its place? Well, Deep Mind. Uh, I believe in 2014 at this conference showed off an incredible paper and some incredible results, okay? DeepMind took a particular machine learning approach and they applied it to the playing of Atari games like Breakout. And what they discovered was that not only does the AI, you know, improve and get competent, it actually discovers techniques, Right, that it discovers like crazy new techniques that humans took quite a while to find. Um, what we'll find later is that they discover techniques that even humans never found. Let's take a look. Around 100 games. So you can see it's pretty, it's not very good, but you can see it's sort of understanding slowly. You can see it's kind of understanding what it's supposed to be doing. It's trying to move towards the ball. This is after an hour of training, so about 200 games. So now you can see it's quantitatively better. It's getting the ball back around 30, 40% of the time. It's still not perfect, but it's getting uh, measurably better. Now after two hours or 300 games, it's better than any human um, can play this game. So it never misses the ball, even when the ball comes back at very fast vertical angles. <laughs> so then we thought, okay, that's pretty good, but let's just leave it training for another two hours, see what happens. And then this amazing thing happened. It sort of worked out the optimal strategy of digging a tunnel to the back. <laughs> And then send the ball round the back. <laughs> so, I when I saw that video, my mind exploded. All right, that is truly impressive. Uh, a very, very impressive um, result of AI. Then also, what's incredible about this is that this team did not need a human to program in techniques for this game. This AI was just given the game given a set of inputs it could play around with, given a way to know if it did well or if it did poorly, right? So it, it receives a little bit of dopamine, digital dopamine, whenever it gets a point, right? Um, and, and receives anti-dopamine. What is that? Serotonin? What's what's the cortisol? The, the stress hormone, I guess. 
whenever it, it loses, right? Or misses. And over time, it figured out not only how to play like a human, but it also figured out an advanced technique. And then it really started to use it very well. And, and so, right, the idea here uh, at a very high level. If you want to learn more about how machine learning loops works at a low level, you can take our um, our fabulous machine learning course. I forget what number it is. What number is that? Does anyone remember the number? It's not 485. It's not 492. I took this course. I can't remember the number. Is it 445? I think it's 445. Yeah, take it. It's good. Um, the idea is you have an algorithm that adjusts its internal state to optimize for some sort of reward, that dopamine we were talking about. In this case, the reward would be the points that you gain when you hit a block. The internal state, well, where should I be, right? Where should I be? Where should the ball be? What should the ball be doing? And other PhD level magic, right? We'll actually go into how this works in just a little bit. Uh, but this is the kind of stuff that you would go into if you were doing a graduate school PhD in computer science for AI, right? Um, what kind of internal state should these algorithms have and how should we make it adjust in response to points um, and, and, uh, and, and positive feedback? So this yields an algorithm, when it's working well, it yields an algorithm that adapts to diverse situations as they appear. And it gets better and better and better. And we don't need to write any code that might break, right? We don't need to hire a human to program how to solve Sudoku with a backtracking algorithm. We just kind of let it run and it figures out how to do all of this stuff on its own. That saves a lot of time and it's also less fragile. If the algorithm runs into a situation that's really just knocking it down and defeating it, then over time it can start to explore alternatives um, and, and figure out new ways to get past it. It's just, it's less fragile than classical AI. It's more flexible, okay? Now here's a really cool example of this, and this actually shows how uh, this is uh, this actually works, what the internal state looks like. Okay, I'll bring myself back here. If you look at this, you've seen Mar I O before. Well, I, I just want to go over this with this context. Let's turn the music down. So what's happening is that the world is being fed to Mario in this kind of really low resolution sampled grid. Okay, Mario, the machine learning uh, algorithm can see these blocks, okay? It can see uh, the player's position and it can see, I believe, enemies as well. Um, and what happens is you can see on here, if you look closely, that there are these faint lines that go into this box. These lines are actually connecting to certain pixels on this low resolution sampled area here. Now, what happens is if one of these pixels is filled up, as in if the game, if the player agent senses uh, that there is a block here. Uh, if it senses that there's a block in one of these pixels, if there's a line connected to it, it will go out to this, it will follow the line, it will go out to uh, a node in this middle network here, okay? This node in the network, I believe, may or may not allow it to go on to this final set of nodes at the very right end. Each of these nodes corresponds to one of the very few input uh, controls on the NES controller. Do I have that controller here? I don't think I have it with me. Uh, but the NES controller is extremely simple. And so what happens is if there's a node here, that signal gets propagated into the middle of this network. This network gets propagated through this network in the middle and then onto an input at the very end, okay? And this structure right here, like which of these pixels goes to which nodes, which go to which other nodes in the middle, which go to which inputs, this is a neural network, okay? It looks like a network, and this is thought of as, um, oh, what are they called in your brain? The little diodes, I guess, that they receive electricity, and when they receive electricity, they pass that electricity on to other neurons. They're called neurons, right? So neurons receive a signal. They decide whether or not to pass that signal on to other neurons. Which neurons they're connected to depends on I guess what you've learned, and as you learn, more new neurons get created, and more neurons connect to different neurons, and right, it's a, it's pretty crazy uh, analog to biology. This is why they're called neural nets. People looked at this and said, "Wow, that kind of reminds us of how we think the brain works," right? And uh, and this can be very very effective. Let's look at a more advanced example. This is the same exact technique. Uh, oh, and by the way, over time, what happens is these neural networks get randomly shifted. 
Okay, they get mutated. Different nodes appear. They connect to different pixels. They connect to different inputs. They connect to different other nodes. And then the best networks are taken and they're kind of merged in a genetic process that creates a new generation of hopefully better and better and better networks that get Mario farther. The dopamine in this particular algorithm is the farther Mario gets to the right, the more points this network gets and the, the more likely this network will be to survive into the next generation and produce the next gen of uh, networks. Okay, so let's get uh, synapses. Yes, thank you. Um, so this uh, is a really cool piece of footage by Matoska Waltz, a former student of ours here, a former 499 student who made this during 499. Uh, and uh, and built a Celeste bot. And, well, there's already an open source one, but he improved it dramatically. And so this uh, this Celeste bot does a lot of what Mar IO does. You can see how it kind of samples the space around it, and it uh, you know it detects where the solid objects are. It detects where killer objects are, and it feeds this information into a network, uh, a uh, neural network, that causes the player to press inputs and causes uh, Madeline uh, to uh, traverse the environment. Uh, now, Celeste is a very difficult game, uh, you know, not just for AI, but for humans too. Uh, and so uh, it doesn't get very far, but over time it gets further and further, it becomes more and more active. It gets more consistent about getting past this early obstacle and it even uh, eventually gets all the way up here into the next room, I believe. So anyway, we falls in the pit. Okay, cool. All right. Um, in my 499 course this semester, Osama Anzari is doing a really cool experiment where he, uh, he has created these hummingbird machine learning agents who have over time, over like thousands of play sessions, they've learned that they can get points. They can get dopamine by drinking from this flower. Okay. Now these flowers used to be stationary, but we decided, you know what? We might be able to make an interesting game if we took one of these flowers and we put it on your player's head and we made the birds like evil. So they're sucking the life out of you as they, they drink from your flower. Um, and so the, the, the question here is, can we use machine learning agents to make an experience more exciting and strange and odd? Um, because uh, one of the things about like programming, hard coding agents with classical approaches is that they can become kind of predictable. Machine learning agents are designed to kind of do strange thing and, and react to flexible, weird situations. And so the idea was, let's try machine learning and see if we can get an agent here that is kind of unpredictable and, uh, and you know, it's gonna surprise the player, create an engaging experience. Uh, the, 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 you know, we're not sure if that's gonna end up happening yet, but you can come to the Design Expo if you want to see the final result. It's gonna be really cool. Foxkilla says, I wonder whether AI difficulty can be tiered by the amount of training time you give it. Uh, like the easy difficulty gets the least training time in the hard. That's actually what Osama was kind of doing. As it turns out, the birds, um, the birds basically do like basically nothing. If you know, after a hundred training sessions, they're like vaguely headed toward a flower, but they don't, they don't do very well. They don't go there fast. They're not efficient at all. When they get to the flower, they're like at the wrong angle, so they bump into it instead of drinking it. Um, however, after thousands, they're very good at getting to a flower very quickly and uh, drinking from it. Um, okay, yes, and that is a good point, uh, Lepetis Le Squarth. Um, developers are often a little bit hesitant to use machine learning because of its kind of black box nature. Uh, it can be hard to understand exactly why an agent is acting the way it is when you didn't actually program it. You just kind of trained it on a bunch of samples. Um, and you know that can make it hard to tune the agent. So let's say you have this AI agent, but you know it's not really it's it's working sort of like how you want it to, but it's too fast or it's too good or it you know it it it's too thoughtful. Well, it might be a little bit hard to tweak how it works, right? Because you've already spent a lot of time to get it to a certain level of behavior. You're gonna have to spend maybe a lot more time to only possibly get it to a different level of behavior. So anyway. Very, very fun stuff. Let's keep going. Okay, so AlphaGo, right? Google's incredible AI uh, machine learning bot uh, that is beating uh, Go chess players left and right. It was acquired by uh, 
uh, Google, I think in 2014, was this associated with DeepMind? This might be a little bit incorrect here. DeepMind was, was acquired by Google in 2014, right? The incredible video we just showed. It uses an advanced tree search in addition to two layers of neural networks. So it's kind of using a hybrid classical and machine learning approach. Um, it was the first program to defeat a professional Go player in 2015, and it was arguably the strongest Go player in history. Okay, it got awarded a Dan 9 ranking in 2016. This is the highest ranking possible. Okay, let's talk about Dota 2. Does anyone play Dota 2 or League of Legends? Very, very cool games. Um, uh, there is a company called OpenAI. They created a, a bot for Dota and uh, Dota 2. And uh, this company was purchased by Elon Musk for about $1 billion. I forget when, though. What's interesting about this AI, and we'll see some video in a sec, is that this AI mainly trains on itself. You know, it doesn't really, I don't think it trains on like professional player data or replays or something like that. It, it is self-taught. Um, and so what happened was, you know, there's no code, hard-coded strategy at first. They, they took their AI uh, and they said, you know what, we're going to clone this AI and we're just going to have this AI fight itself. And so when, when the AI, when one clone of the AI experiments and does something that increases its dopamine, um, the other AI uh, will go and, and uh, experiment in a different way, right? And they'll kind of compete and they'll, they'll experiment with different strategies and we'll find the ones that work faster, right? Um, and so it had one month of playing itself uh, observations, actions, and feedback. In August 2017, it beat professional players at the Dota 2 International, which I believe is one of the biggest tournaments there is. Um, and so let's watch a little video on this topic. And in particular, listen to how the professional human players kind of characterize and describe this AI that they played against. Things that the AI does and things that the AI doesn't do. Let's take a look. OpenAI's goal is to build safe, artificial general intelligence. We know that AI can be extremely beneficial to humanity, and it's going to require fundamental advances to see what it's really capable of. Dota is a great test bed for artificial intelligence. It's a very complicated game with a large competitive scene. And what this means is that you have to develop new techniques. You have to push forward the boundary of what's possible in order to get anywhere. For this project, we're building a Dota player. We're starting with a bot capable of beating top professional players at Dota 1v1. The rules of Dota are so complicated that if you just think really hard about how the game works and try to write those rules down, you're not even gonna be able to reach the performance of a reasonable player. So our bot is trained entirely through self-play. It starts out completely random with no knowledge of the world and simply plays against a copy of itself, which means it always has an evenly matched opponent. And it climbs this ladder of skill level until it's able to reach the performance of the best professional players in the world. The International is Dota's world championships. 20,000 fans come from around the world to watch professionals compete for a $24 million prize pool. Over the course of the International, we tested our bot against a number of professional players. It turns out that our AI has learned really robust skills in the game that is actually really competitive with these pros. Many of the pros wanted to keep playing the bot and started talking about using it as part of their training routine. My first impressions is it's pretty easy to get tilted from losing to like a bot. And I think the problem relies in people don't usually expect such a strong bot. Now he has a double wave and I can't trade hits with him. And he's gonna be level three before me with full HP. I think, I don't know, watching the replay, honestly, I, I just learned something. So it's pretty helpful. Like I felt like I'm one of the strongest SFs and knowing that this move like, if I can foresee that if I make this move, this will happen to my wave and this is what's going to happen. It's just pretty nice to experience it. Like, someone could tell me this could happen, but I think experiencing it is just another level of knowledge. In addition to the pros, we thought it was pretty cool that a number of amateur players enjoyed playing the bot as well. Uh, it does kind of, I think that it would open up out of the box thinking because there's many ways to win a game of Dota specifically. Okay, he's ignoring the fairy fires. The bot is good. The bot is better than I could have ever imagined. That, we can get one hit from the donkey. Hello. <laughs> he took the bait. Okay. 
So, your bot does not attack random things on the ground. Does not attack random things on the ground. It predicts where you go in the darkness. Yeah, yeah that, I did, can I play again? You're very welcome Okay, to. we're gonna go one more. This event was us introducing our Dota project to the world. The next step is to try to build a team of five AIs and see if we can get it to reach the level of the top human professionals. Beyond that, we want to start mixing together AIs and human players on a single team and try to reach levels of performance that neither of them can reach on their own. We're super excited to see where that goes and hope that you'll stay tuned. Is, is that crazy or what? Right, extremely inspiring and very interesting. Um, this video also brings up some interesting implications too. Um, the the uh, uh, player, the professional players were actually noting that the bot seems to be doing things that are unexpected, doing things that the players didn't really, you don't see from humans very much, right? And um, they even wanted to play against these bots and they, they, they were getting ideas, right? They were learning something from playing against these uh, bots, these really unique players. And so I want, to, I want you to start thinking, okay, beyond just creating a bot that wins some championships and maybe some prize money, what could you use this for? And more generally, you know, could you, for instance, use this for education, right? So maybe there are strategies out there that exist, but humans haven't really discovered them yet. Maybe because they're too arduous for humans until they understand how to do them, or maybe they're just so unintuitive, or maybe you have to play in such a, in a non-normal or innovative way, right? So against the grain to make them work that a, a computer doesn't even know what the current status quo is for this game or for this this um, objective, right? For this mission, but they'll try whatever, right? And so they might discover things that we won't as humans. Um, it is interesting that they said they wanted to incorporate human players into their teams. That's right, right? Uh, so think about uh, education, think about play testing, okay? People spend a lot of money, uh, the development studios spend a lot of money to test their games. Corporations spend a lot of uh, money to test their general purpose software. Microsoft Windows, Mac OS X, Word. Uh, maybe can we have a bot that knows how to find security uh, vulnerabilities and knows how to try out really weird and unexpected stuff? You know, can we do it? There would be big implications if we could. A lot of efficiency could be gained. Okay, so OpenAI and Dota 2. Why does this all matter? Okay, why is machine learning a little bit more than just a neat little new thing to generate a few papers and fill some news articles, right? Why does this stuff matter? Well, it's everywhere now, right? These technologies are starting to really bleed over into impactful real life stuff. For instance, the idea of transportation and transit, right? How much more efficient can we make humans and how much time can we give back to them if they don't have to drive uh, when they're being moved, you know, in America where we don't have a bunch of public transit and trains because we're so big and, and so um, sparsely populated, um, you know, why you, can we give people back two hours of their day if they can like read a book in the car or study in the car or do their homework in the car or do all this other stuff, right? Watch a movie while their car drives for them. Why not, right? Games are a set of interesting decisions, right? Previously, if then do you know very uh classical style uh but now you know we can evaluate a complex search tree and we can kind of use statistics to gauge you know hey in this current situation and into the future what is the best decision as we see more and more examples and results so we can use this uh research for projects that lead to, to bigger things we can reduce risk uh, we can create programs that mimic human behavior um, one of the coolest things is that, so kind of a general purpose human level AI that can be as flexible as humans is kind of like the holy grail of AI, right? As it turns out, um, video games offer kind of a simplified and, you know, um, uh, kind of interesting and flexible and experimental uh, representation of the real world, right? The real world has ex a, an extreme variety of decisions that are very deep and have a lot of consequence. But games can have that too, not on the same scale at all, but can have some of that too. So it's really great for, it's really great that we're combining games and AI in, in the modern day, right? Helping them both advance. Collaboration, cooperation, risk testing. What's the catch, right? 
what is the catch? What is the big block right now with machine learning and its impact? Well, if we go back to that video we saw earlier, we're going to see this, okay? 600 training episodes before the AI starts to do something interesting. That is a lot of time on a very simple game, okay? Now, while it might be a lot faster than like a human baby takes to learn how to play Breakout, it's still a long time. That's a lot of computing power and electricity and costs. Um, and so if you go into grad school, one thing you might well study is, okay, we got machine learning. It's working. It's correct. It does cool stuff, but it's inefficient. It's not practical, right? We can't make AI accessible to all if it's super expensive and only the, the wealthiest corporations and institutions can afford it, right? How can we make machine learning and its impact more accessible, right? It takes one month of playing itself. Oh, darn it. That's a long time. Darn it. Right? How can we make the result more adaptable? Um, so unfortunately, a, a little while ago, a few years ago, there was a bad situation where Uber, uh, an Uber car driving autonomously in Arizona, uh, it was at night. And there was a lady who was jaywalking across the street, I believe, at night. And uh, the, car, the car wasn't ready. Uh, the software didn't recognize her crossing the street and it struck her. And uh, unfortunately, she, she uh, died uh, due to that. And what happened was the, the car had been working, I believe, fairly well in the daytime. But when the light conditions shifted, uh, the vehicle struggled. Uh, it's um, it's the, the, the model that it had trained over time wasn't flexible enough to deal with that specific situation. And a, a terrible result occurred, right? So how can we make uh, the model that gets trained more adaptable and flexible to different situations? Kind of like a, a human is super flexible, right? What new industries may we apply this approach to? So how about let's use machine learning to remaster some old awesome video games, right? You can actually Google this, Resident Evil 3 uh, upgrade, uh, texture upgrade via machine learning. Um, it's really interesting. In the newest uh, graphics cards by NVIDIA, they actually include uh, cores dedicated to machine learning. And I, is it, what, I forget what it's called, it's like DLSS or something. It's a technique where instead of computing the lighting conditions on a texture, what we're going to do is we're going to compute a low resolution uh, result for, for lighting. And then we're going to use machine learning, which is faster to use once it's been trained. We're going to use machine learning to figure out what the sharper image should look like. And so it allows you to actually get out of expensive rendering techniques and say, you know what, we're gonna do a really low-fi version and then we're gonna use machine learning to clean it up. And it's gonna be a lot faster because the lighting computation is very, very uh, uh, compute intensive uh, and the machine learning in the meantime is just kind of quick, right? Um, training takes a long time, but evaluating a network doesn't take quite as much time. Uh, so anyway, it's, it's just ridiculous. Uh, not, nothing I would have thought possible, really, until it happened. And so it, currently, machine learning and AI, it's the single largest category of incoming PhD students at, at Michigan, and it's not even close, okay? Um, and I think it's because of all of this potential, right? This is an area of research that's having immense and extremely visible impact on the world right now in ways large and small. Uh, so, um, yeah, second place had like one-third the students, I, th I think it was like computer vision or something. I can't remember. Um, but let's talk about some tools that work today. Okay, let's step back from machine learning right now that work really well today. Pathfinding. You've dealt with pathfinding before. Um, pathfinding, there are a bunch of different techniques that you can use. And you can actually, in this cool little demo, you can actually play around with them some. So we've got this starting point. We've got some, this ending point, And we got an algorithm we can choose over here. So A star, Manhattan style. We can just start the search and it immediately goes straight there. And we can actually see statistics too. So this took uh, uh, 10 turns and a time of six milliseconds and 47 operations, okay? Um, and sorry, uh, a length of 10, the final path. Okay, well, let's, uh, let's make this a little bit harder. Let's draw on a wall here and see how it does. So A star will continue to search largely in this direction. And so it got it done with uh, three milliseconds, 100 operations. Let's change this from A star to uh, a much more uh, generic, um, let's do breadth first search. If you recall, breadth first search is the option that kind of expands around in all directions. Uh, uh, okay, so let's try this, restart path. 
Whoa, it's taking a while. This is taking a while. It, if, you, if you look, you can see it's keeping track of a lot more positions, this blue area, than the A star was. All right, so wow, this is super inefficient. Uh, and it should find it now, right? There we go, okay. So that took like eight times as many operations, uh, but interestingly, it took less time in milliseconds. I'm, I'm very suspicious of that uh, result right there. Um, okay, so uh, you, can draw, you can draw any sort of super complicated path that you want. It's an extremely fun tool. Uh, Pathfinding is a really, really cool um, area that's still receiving, I believe, some research, uh, though not a ton. Um, at any rate, it's, it's fun to play around with. Choosing the right algorithm can be very, very important. Okay, so let's uh, let's get back to it, and uh, I think we got it down here. Here we go. Um, there's actually another technique you, you can use. So pathfinding for a um, pathfinding for a particular agent uh, can be very expensive. A star is not a cheap operation to run, uh, and you know we ran it only on one agent right there in the previous example. But imagine you want to make a game with like a ton of agents, like a simulation of a theme park. Right. Sorry about this gif. This is a, a gif of like a roller coaster coming through here and sending everyone flying. They all survived. They're all fine. They're just a bit dizzy. Don't worry. Don't don't think about it. Um, and so uh, the question is, how can you use an expensive pathfinding algorithm like A star when you have like tens of thousands of agents operating in your simulation all at once? That sounds like a disaster. It's not going to work. A star doesn't scale very well. Many pathfinding algorithms don't. Um, and so what you do is you use a new technique. You use a technique called flow or vector fields. Okay, and you can actually see what these look like here. The idea is you use kind of a flow approach, a, a sink, like a kitchen sink approach or a faucet approach. <clears throat> so let's uh, let's watch uh, let's watch this little footage here. Go. Okay. So you can see all the agents walking through here. Okay. And what happens is when you put something that could be a possible destination in your environment, you use a algorithm called, uh, I think I think like Dijkstra would work. Uh, so it's an algorithm that is um, uh, single source, like multi-destination, right? And so what happens is from a single important point on in your map, you do this algorithm that tells your game, it builds a data structure that says from any other space on the map how to get to the single point. In other words, if you are right here on this corner tile, you will look at your data structure and you'll see that, oh, I should go right. I just see, I just see like a little arrow, a little bit of data telling me to go right if I'm on this particular tile to get to this destination, all right? And what happens, what's really cool about this is that any agent in the scene, if it wants to get to this destination in the middle, it has to do an O of one time lookup. It says, okay, what tile am I on? Looks into the data structure. Okay, at tile X equals five, Y equals three, go right, <laughs> okay? And if you go right, you get to a new tile. You look at what tile, what uh, that tile is in the data structure says go down, okay? Go down, blah, 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 and you just kind of follow it with these O to one operations to get to where you want to go. Now, you create a new data structure like this, a new map, a flow, a flow grid, um, for every single new attraction or destination you have in your, your map, okay? Now, this seems like it might be really expensive, might take a lot of memory, but if you have a lot more agents in your map, if you have tens of thousands of agents, and you only have tens of destinations, then that memory cost is actually worth it because you need to prioritize that lookup, right? So what an agent just decides which destination it wants to go to, and then it looks up the correct data structure, O of one, and it knows which way to go, right? So that's pathfinding for truly massive crowds. Um, this doesn't work if you have a ton of destinations that your agents want to go to, um, but it can work otherwise, all right? That's how games like this work, where you just have a massive amount of agents everywhere. They all need to do some sort of pathfinding to get to certain specific, a small set of specific places. Okay, we've got things like behavior trees. This is essentially like nested if-else statements that are kind of the way you're used to programming. This still works, and it's still used quite a bit, uh, fortunately un or unfortunately, in, uh, in game dev and AI. Um, this is a really, really cool blog. I posted it here, sf2platinum.wordpress. 
uh, com. Uh, they actually broke down the assembly for Street Fighter 2, and they discovered that, yes, the game does in fact cheat. Okay, It reads your inputs and decides whether it wants to block them or not. Um, it, it cheats, uh, and that's why some of the bosses and fights in this game on harder difficulties feel very unfair and sometimes impossible, like you're just playing the lottery, essentially, while they eat your quarters up. Blah. Okay, procedural generation, right? It happens in a lot of games. It's a very, very popular topic. We might talk about that a little bit more next time. Uh, we might want to show you some, some of how Spelunky works. Um, but here's what you should know. Procedural generation is not a panacea.